Welcome everyone to Unit 6 on Interpersonal Negotiation. This is Dr. Moore. Negotiation simply means to settle a dispute by discussions and mutual agreement. It involves a process of problem solving when topic, relationship, identity, and process issues arise. Interestingly, surveys have shown most people prefer to handle conflict on their own rather than asking for a third party to help. People report greater satisfaction when they work out differences on their own. But, and here's a caveat, there is also less emotional resolution when things are handled on your own. This suggests that negotiation should not simply be a cold analytical process, but should also deal with emotions and underlying issues more than merely topic issues. As the authors of the text note, all the layers of conflict issues, trip concerns, matter no matter what form of conflict resolution is that is used. Negotiation is presented in this unit as a form of conflict resolution. It's an approach that occurs in our everyday lives where we negotiate for specific agreements. Negotiation is an active part of conflict resolution where people generate options, brainstorm ideas, and try to get their goals met. It involves engagement and not avoidance. It is an approach that involves efforts to resolve conflicts without third-party intervention. People are trying to work things out between them without an outside negotiator, a mediator, the courts, or a counselor, which all involve a formal intervention. Informal intervention could take the form of a friend or a neighbor who is trying to help out. We'll save third-party intervention for the next unit as we're focusing on negotiation as an approach we can use or as one path to problem resolution without bringing in a third party. Negotiation between two parties can either be competitive or integrative. The process is usually a bit messy and unstructured. The process usually begins as competitive and eventually becomes collaborative. It begins as competitive because a conflict causes us to become defensive or offensive, if you will. It's related to the fight or flight response we have in our primitive brain. When we perceive a threat to our well-being, and in this case someone blocking our path to our goals or keeping us from having our needs met, we react in order to protect ourselves. But when we realize this is happening, we can take steps to change the conflict into one where we are more receptive and less defensive so that problem solving can happen. Again, negotiation is one path to problem resolution. On the conflict spectrum, it falls midway between avoidance and domination. In order to find and stay in this sweet spot, we need to change our defensive posturing and create a climate where mutual problem solving can occur and resolution is invited. Domination doesn't work because cooperation is key. Neither party can force their own resolution on the other because that'll just create defensiveness and prevent mutual cooperation. Both parties must believe a successful resolution is possible. Both must have hope that the conflict can be resolved. Otherwise, cooperation will not happen. Negotiation is a wide path on the conflict spectrum because, as I mentioned, negotiation can be messy. And when people are in a fight-or-flight mode, they may act in irrational ways. They may blame the other person for their own reactions so they don't change their own behavior. They may overreact, thus escalating the importance of the conflict. Or they may be responding out of habit in a way he or she developed in the family of origin during the formative years and in a way that he or she is most comfortable with. Some people may emotionally distance themselves from the conflict by concentrating on details or unrelated issues and slide over toward the avoidance side of this spectrum. Communication is a vital part of negotiation and it always takes one party to act first by being collaborative and unlocking defensiveness. Interpersonal negotiation requires working toward fully understanding the real or underlying interests of the other party's position. Let the other know that you are interested in addressing their emotional concerns or interests. 
say that I want us both to be happy with this agreement. Invite concerns. This can be achieved by active listening and expressing empathy. Reflect their underlying concerns as you understand them and give them an opportunity to clarify your understanding. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, all the layers of conflict issues, trip concerns, matter. So remember the overlapping nature of trip concerns. Trip concerns are always present and they can't emerge appearing like something else. Three possible outcomes of negotiation are problem resolution, partial resolution, and an impasse. For negotiation to occur, a certain communication climate has to be present. The parties need to recognize their interdependence, be willing to work on both incompatible and overlapping trip goals, and finally, the parties need to establish enough of a power balance so that they can problem solve. Argumentation is one of the main communication skills needed to negotiate successfully. Constructive argumentation involves staying compassionate while staying calm and using the principles of argumentation to state and support your position. Topic disagreements do not have to take over other trip concerns. Positively support other trip concerns while arguing about the topic. See Infante's list of what it takes to be an effective arguer who tests ideas and not people in this chapter. And finally, going back to chapter 6, it's important to manage your emotions. Don't raise your voice. Speaking in a calm voice does wonders for helping each of you to be heard and understood. Let the other person finish what they're saying and don't talk over each other. Constructive argumentation shouldn't sound like an episode of The View or Jerry Springer. It's amazing how quickly arguments between people can veer off topic concerns when emotions aren't managed. Also, don't threaten your relationship. Threatening to leave only escalates a conflict. It puts the other in a fight-or-flight mode and forces one to address relational issues rather than topic concerns. And finally, don't stockpile. This is where you bring up issues from the past rather than dealing with the current topic. Now, along the path of negotiation, there are two approaches, competitive and integrative. Very briefly, competitive negotiation involves the belief that one person wins and the other loses. There is competition for what is perceived to be limited resources or rewards, which are seen as coming from a fixed pie to be distributed. Integrative negotiation, on the other hand, sees the possibility of both winning and both parties gaining something. Even though positions may be opposite and not connected, through constructive argumentation these opposites can eventually be seen as connected and common interests can be addressed. This involves stepping back from the situation and finding a creative way to be sure resource distribution is fair and integrative. Common interests are searched for. The goal is different here. It's to find a mutually satisfying agreement and a, a good relationship. It involves getting a different perspective rather than merely reacting to a conflict and running on competitive emotions. William Yuri has a better way to say this in one of the conflict resolution videos in this unit. He says the first step is to go to the balcony and get a fresh perspective on the conflict. Integrative negotiation sounds great, doesn't it? Well, it's difficult to do. This leads us to look at the disadvantages. First of all, it requires a high level of intelligence, perception, and inventiveness. It's not a quick fix. It requires training and considerable skill. And good bargaining may be equated with competitiveness, so it can be confused with competitive negotiation. And it requires hard work and a commitment to high standards. Both sides must believe that a win-win is possible. I really like the text that we're using because this chapter, as well as the others, gives us specific suggestions on how we can improve our conflict resolution skills. Some coaching techniques are provided in this chapter that help us to get into and stay in the negotiating range of the conflict continuum and to engage in collaborative negotiation. The first one is to label the conflict differently.
This involves something called reframing. Conflicts are described or framed in a way that may make them seem competitive and may make communication difficult. Reframing puts the conflict into a different category where integrative solutions can be found. How we look at situations, how we describe them, affects how we feel about them. Reframing actually opens a door for creative solutions. As Albert Einstein once said, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Another coaching technique is to suggest new rituals to do together. This comes from couples counseling. This is helpful to address micro events when they start. Instead of here we go again, you can short circuit a micro event. When a conflict starts, a calming ritual like going for a walk can help to calm emotions and help each to gain a fresh perspective. Expanding the pie is also helpful because seeing limited resources leads to competitiveness. Expanding the pie involves reframing from a win-lose situation to a win-win where both sides benefit. Let's say a husband and wife are arguing because they wanted to take time off from work to spend the holidays together at a nice resort. But the husband has to go on a business trip over the holidays to Las Vegas. And at first, they see this as win-lose. But rather than seeing the pie is fixed, they expand it so that she can go to Las Vegas with her husband and at least they can spend some time together at a nice resort. In addition to coaching techniques, this chapter uh, presents uh, the seven elements of principled negotiation as a practical approach to collaborative negotiation. This has been a very popular and widely used uh, approach. It's actually a guide to help us reach effective and mutually satisfying negotiated settlements. First, attend to the relationship. Focus on the problem and attack the problem, not each other. Treat each other with respect. Secondly, attend to all elements of communication. In other words, stay positive and pay attention to the discussion of emotions. Remember the core concerns of appreciation, affiliation, autonomy, status, and a role that works for each party. You may want to review them from Chapter 5. Thirdly, focus on interests, not positions. Positions come from interests. We usually are not very good at knowing what the other person really wants, so time spent trying to understand the other person's interests by asking open-ended questions can bring out relational and identity interests and foster more effective communication. Fourth, generate many options. Brainstorming can provide more options and generate creative discussions. Five, find legitimate criteria. How will you know if an agreement is fair? You need to decide what criteria you will use to evaluate whether it is or not. Six, analyze the best alternative to a negotiated agreement or BATNA. Sometimes an impasse is reached, or one party may become frustrated or upset and simply walk away. This particular principle says it's good to review the BATNA so both can see what is at stake if an agreement is not reached. And finally, seven, work with fair and realistic commitments. In other words, make sure a plan or settlement is actually doable. By this point in the course, I'm sure that you know that conflict resolution is complex and we can run into roadblocks on the way to a negotiated settlement. The core concerns can be difficult to put into practice for numerous reasons. One of the reasons is people sometimes have excessively self-centered perspectives. That's a nice way to say that some people have difficulty seeing past their own noses. Another reason is strong negative emotions sometimes interfere with one's mental ability to take an integrative approach. The emotions simply become overwhelming. Another reason is automatic ways of thinking are counter to integrative thinking. People may not be aware of their tendency to think in terms of black and white or all or nothing. Next, there may be insensitivity to emotions. 
the emotional intelligence may be lacking for some reason. And finally, insufficient social skills and a lack of mental focus, which means people may be distracted or somehow have some other issues, such as uh, psychological or physiological problems, with, which interfere with their ability to use the core concerns. In conclusion, I'm going to uh, highlight some suggestions to move toward an integrative approach. Stick to principled negotiation. Rely on the core concerns. Stay optimistic that a positive agreement can be reached. And remember that interpersonal negotiation is not a neat, clean, straightforward process. No matter how far down the wrong road you go, you can always turn back. <laughs>